Tonight, a public inquiry hears a PC claim Sheku Bayo stamped on a female officer. To get him on the ground, um, to get some sort of control over him, um, would have been the best option. Um, so I dropped the bag and proceeded with the shoulder charge. Also making the headlines, are we headed for even more train disruption? Rail workers are to be balloted for strike action. With hundreds of services already being cut, patience is running out. We are the people that are trying to keep the economy, the local economy, the national economy going. And it's only fair that you get this sorted out and give us a chance to do what we do. Tonight's sport comes from Hamden on the eve of the Scottish Cup final. And Scotland's ancient capital becomes the country's newest city. I'm Emma Cameron in Edinburgh. And I'm John Mackay in Glasgow. This is the STV News at six. Good evening. A police constable who was involved in the incident which led to Sheku Bayo being restrained and subsequently dying has admitted he was together with other officers and able to discuss some of the circumstances before any statements were taken from them. PC Craig Walker also told the public inquiry Mr Bayo had stamped on a female officer. Evidence is being heard in connection with the events in Kirkcaldy in May 2015. Here's our senior reporter Gordon Cree. Captured on Snapchat, this video shows Sheku Bio being restrained in Kirkcaldy's Hayfield Road. It was played at the inquiry today as one of the officers gave evidence. PC Craig Walker said that after the incident, he and colleagues gathered in the canteen at the town's police station and he admitted there was some discussion prior to any formal investigation. It was near Oh, I sprayed him with the pava and this was his reaction and this is what happened. And did you see him doing that? Did you see this happening? Um, did you tell people what you'd done? Um, yes, that the, the spray didn't work on him. And uh, that, at that point I was uh, concerned. Uh, again, that, that's, that, this is the overlap between the, the, the welfare issue where you're sitting down and uh, dealing with the trauma that you've just been through um, as a team. Um, and trying to still be professional and know. Um. Earlier, PC Walker had claimed Mr Bio had stamped on PC Nicole Short after being pava sprayed. He was asked to demonstrate what happened and said that's when he considered using a baton. I just decided that the baton was not the best option mm -hmm. and that to get him on the ground um, to get some sort of control over him um, would have been the best option. Um, so I dropped the baton and proceeded with a shoulder charge. This inquiry is looking into the circumstances of Mr Bio's death in 2015, the investigation afterwards and whether race was a factor in any of it. PC Walker is the first of the officers who were on the scene that day to give evidence to the inquiry. It now moves on to the rest of them, beginning on Tuesday with Nicole Short. Sheku's sister has attended every day of hearings. Well, it's heartbreaking because we knew that um, when he met the police, he had no weapon on him, he had no knife on him. And it's clear now that when he met with them, he had no knife on him. So we knew that from, you know, from when they were telling us all these different stories. Tonight, many more questions and answers lie ahead. Gordon Cree, STV News, Edinburgh. The First Minister says triggering a trade war with the European Union would be catastrophic for Scotland in the midst of a cost of living crisis. Nicola Sturgeon believes unilateral action by the UK government to scrap parts of the Northern Ireland Protocol would have a severe impact on businesses. Her comments came after a meeting with the Sinn Féin Vice President Michelle O'Neill in Edinburgh. However, the UK government has said its proposals are not intended to damage the protocol. Our political correspondent Ewan Petrie reports. Two weeks after her party's historic election result, Sinn Féin's vice president arrived at Butte House, having requested a meeting with the First Minister. The main unionist party in Northern Ireland, the DUP, has blocked the formation of a power-sharing administration. 
It wants changes to part of the Brexit deal it says has created trade barriers with Great Britain. We're living through a cost of living crisis. People are struggling to put food on their table and to heat their homes. And I'm angry on behalf of the people that elected us because they want us to be in government. And Boris Johnson, instead of pandering to the DUP, should actually be encouraging them to fulfil their responsibilities. They've been given a mandate like the rest of us, join the rest of us in government. And all the while we can do that. And alongside that, we can find ways to smooth the implementation of the protocol. The Northern Ireland Protocol is a trading arrangement designed to prevent a hard border in the island of Ireland. However, it has in effect created one in the Irish Sea. The UK government has said it wants to scrap parts of the protocol to break the deadlock. The big concern I have is that unilateral action on the part of the UK would trigger potentially some trade war with the EU and and that would be catastrophic for all of us at a time when people are already suffering the impacts of the cost of living crisis. The Prime Minister flew to Belfast earlier this week for talks with leaders of the five main political parties in Stormont but with little progress. Our proposal is a relatively simple one. It's a green channel for goods going into Northern Ireland and it's a red channel for goods going from GB into the Republic of Ireland. It seems perfectly sensible. And I think when they look through the detail, um, the EU, they'll realise that we're not seeking to damage the protocol, but the articles that we're using uh, that that exist in there at the moment to amend it are the articles that we think are relevant here. While the Conservatives criticised the meeting with Ms O'Neill, the First Minister has invited the DUP and Alliance parties for talks on the same issues. Ewan Petrie, STV News. Rail workers are to be balloted on strike action after the RMT union rejected ScotRail's 2.2% pay offer as derisory. The announcement comes just days ahead of temporary cuts to 700 train services next week. ScotRail has put a reduced timetable in place to cope with a dispute with the train drivers union, Aslev. The Transport Minister, who met with ScotRail this afternoon, has dismissed fears of a summer of chaos for rail passengers. Our chief reporter, Sharon Frew, has the latest. Commuters will be facing more cancellations from Monday. ScotRail say a reduced timetable is necessary to give passengers certainty. But some travelling earlier are worried about what this will mean for their journeys on routes that are already very busy. The first train from Inverness to Aberdeen, it was only two carriages, so there was a lot of people standing. Um, and they did actually apologise over the tannoy uh, on, the, on the journey, saying, sorry, it's quite a squeeze. Well, I live in Aberdeen, so I come down to Glasgow every now and then, but quite a lot, actually. So, so yeah, that's quite an important thing for me, I guess, especially if there are going to be no trains after eight. Well, it affects my ability to get into work on time and to get home in time for my kids after school on time. It affects my social plans for the next three weekends because we've got plans to come to Glasgow, go to events, and we stay on the East Coast, so that's a nightmare. The May timetable had approximately 2,150 weekday services, but from Monday, this will reduce by a third. Many routes will stop running before 8pm. The last train from Edinburgh to Glasgow will be at 10.15 instead of 11.45pm. For those heading to Aberdeen from Glasgow, the last train will be three hours earlier at 6.40. Those travelling from Dundee to Edinburgh will need to leave around the same time. And if you're catching a train from Malig, well, you'll need to be an early riser. If you miss the 6am to Glasgow, you'll be waiting 24 hours for the next direct service. This pub owner in Glasgow is worried. He relies on trade from its neighbouring music venues. It really is going to be very, very detrimental to our trade. I don't think any thought's been given to people that don't have a choice. People are not going out for a drink. People that are working in this industry or other industries. How are they going to get home? I think when the government took over the running of ScotRail, they should have confronted this head on immediately. And I think they should have knocked the heads together. The Transport Minister met with ScotRail this afternoon. 
it's not going to be a, a summer of chaos. I, I wouldn't describe it as that. And actually, the reduced service is deemed necessary by Scotrail. We need to remember to give passengers certainty. So it's the opposite of chaos, arguably, because it's certainty in the next few weeks about where and when they can travel by rail. But it's not where we should be in terms of provision. I accept that. I'm absolutely committed to working with Scotrail uh, and our trade union partners to get to a better place. But that requires both Scotrail and the trade unions to work together. Scotrail is blaming the cuts on driver shortages. Some members of the Athlef union are refusing to work overtime or rest days until a pay dispute is resolved. The union rejected a 2.2 pay rise. Now the RMT union has also rejected this offer and is balloting its members. Sharon Frew, STV News, Glasgow. 11 new cases of monkeypox have been confirmed in the UK, bringing the total to 20. There are no known cases in Scotland, but there are now 127 cases with outbreaks across Europe, Canada, Australia and the United States. Well, we all saw how COVID developed, so how worried should we be about this latest outbreak? We're joined by the National Clinical Director, Jason Leach. Uh, Professor Leach, what do you know about this virus? Well, the important difference here, John, is exactly that. It's known. Remember two and a half years ago when you and I sat here, we talked about a novel virus. Didn't have a name didn't have a disease name, we didn't know who it hurt, we didn't know how to treat it or vaccinate it. This is a known disease that we know quite a lot about, actually. It comes from West and Central Africa, usually from dead or diseased animals, transmits to humans, then forms little small, traditionally, outbreaks in humans. And occasionally they get out of West and Central Africa, to the US, to Europe. We've had cases here before in Europe. And usually, if you interrupt the chains of transmission, remember that? Remember yeah. track and trace? And remember all those things? Yeah. Contact tracing? If you get the chains of transmission, and you can usually find them fairly easily, you can knock this disease on its head. It's usually also quite mild. It can be unpleasant, but it's usually quite mild. No cases in Scotland. So the first and most important thing is everybody just needs to take a breath um, and calm down. Okay. Why has it seemingly spread so much just now, though? Yeah, it's still quite small numbers. So what happens is it's quite an infectious virus. Not as infectious or as airborne as COVID and the things we're used to with flu, but it can move from person to person. You need to be pretty close. It's droplet spread. So it's families, it's sexual partners, it's people who are in very close proximity. And you get general fever, the kind of viral disease, but you also get a rash. So if that happens or if you're concerned you should contact a health professional. If we're in touch with you in England, in Scotland, wherever, it's because we're contact tracing you. And that's an old fashioned way of doing public health. It's just that we've talked about it a lot in the last two years. Well, that's it. So this, is, this is the same sort of this techniques. This is exactly what we would have done 10 years ago. It's just with COVID, we were doing it live on telly. This is a well-known, a standard disease. It's unpleasant, so I'm not complacent. We're doing a lot of surveillance. We're following up contacts in England. If it comes to Scotland, we will do exactly the same. Our public health is ready. We know what it looks like. We know who's at risk and we'll be able to deal with it. So very briefly, absolutely no cause for panic. This will eventually be, go away, essentially. No cause for panic, but not complacent. So the public health community is managing this exactly as it should be managed. There are a few more cases around Europe than we would like. So in Europe, we're talking to all of our European colleagues. We're interrupting the chains of transmission and you don't need to worry. Professor Leach, thanks for joining us on the STV News. Thank you. Now, people aged 16 and over with learning disabilities are to get free annual health checks. The Scottish Government has announced that health boards will share £2 million of funding with GPs carrying out the checks. It's hoped it will help in the quicker identification of potential health issues and address what some feel is currently a postcode lottery when it comes to support, as Louise Hosey reports. Living with Down syndrome means Kevin is at high risk of developing certain conditions. He and his mom have welcomed today's announcement that annual checks will now be available for people with learning disabilities across Scotland. It's been really patchy. The services that have been available in different areas um, have been better for different things. So it's not been consistent. It's good to, to think that this is going to be something across Scotland opposed to, you know, like I say, a service that's a postcode lottery. Researchers found that adults with learning disabilities are twice as likely to die from preventable deaths. For those with Down syndrome, premature deaths can be five times higher compared with the general population. One organisation says the yearly checks are long awaited and could be a lifesaver. 
We're really delighted uh, to hear this announcement today uh, by the Scottish Government. It's so important for everybody living with a learning disability in Scotland. Studies are now reporting that uh, people with learning disabilities uh, were discriminated throughout the pandemic in terms of access to good health care. So it's just really important and timely that these annual health checks are being introduced now. The Scottish Government has allocated £2 million of funding to health boards across the country. The health checks will be carried out by GPs with the aim of identifying any issues and treating them as quickly as possible. It's really important, otherwise, you know, you'd be um, not living the life you're living. <laughs> <laughs> it's expected to be rolled out from next month. Louise Hosey, STV News. Time now to look at other stories across Scotland and the former Transport Minister Derek Mackay has been asked to provide written evidence on his involvement in the awarding of the contract to build two new CalMac ferries. Mr Mackay, who resigned over messages he sent to a teenage boy in 2020, was involved in the sign-off of the contract for two hulls in 2015. The two ships are now running five years late and more than £150 million over budget. Meanwhile, the ferry service from Skye to North Uist and Harris was cancelled today after the MV Hebrides hit the pier in Loch Maddy on Wednesday. The incident has had a knock-on effect across CalMac's operations, with the second Arran and second Isla vessels having to be redeployed across the network to cover the gaps. The richest person in Scotland continues to be fashion tycoon and Highland landowner Anders Hulk Polfsen. According to the Sunday Times Rich List for 2022, the Danish entrepreneur who owns a popular brand ASOS is worth around £6.5 billion. He owns more than 200,000 acres of land, including the Glenfetti estate, making him Scotland's largest landowner. The number of people in Scotland with COVID-19 has fallen for the eighth week in a row. It's estimated 1 in 45 people is infected, down from 1 in 35 last week. It's the lowest estimate for infections in Scotland since before Christmas. Hundreds of Rangers supporters gathered outside Ibrox to pay respect to the late kit man Jimmy Bell. Cortege passed the stadium with those lining the streets applauding the man who worked for the club for more than 30 years. Fans called him Mr Rangers and part of the club's DNA. He's been here for a long, long time and like it just shows he's a kit man and look at the crowd that's here uh, for him today. He was a hero in the eyes of the Rangers fans and he is, as I say, he was Mr Rangers. And it's just sad that we couldn't bring that cup and sit it there for him as that cottage drives by him in the back. It has been very emotional. There's been on a brilliant run and we can't take that away for Glasgow Rangers. We can't take that away from him and it would have been even better if we did get it for Jimmy Bell. I thought, really to be quite honest with you, I thought he would have done it for Jimmy and Walter. I really did, but hey, there's always tomorrow. You know what I mean? They'll, they'll do it tomorrow, uh, and that shall be for Walter and Jimmy. It's often called the Rangers family, and certainly, certainly, as you can see here, there's a good turnout for him, so a lot of people want to pay their respects to him. Um, so I think that just shows you the kind of measure of the man. Remembering Jimmy Bell. Well, now to the sport, and Raman is just off the plane from Seville and pretty much gone straight to Hamden. Get your fill of the action. STV Sports, sponsored by Papa John's Pizza. Good evening. This is what Rangers and Hearts will be competing for in tomorrow's Scottish Cup final. The Ibrox side last lifted this trophy 13 years ago. Hearts last won it in 2012. Giovanni Van Bronca says after the disappointment of losing the Europa League final, his players will be ready to give it their all tomorrow. As Ollie Dickinson now reports. 24 hours after their return from Seville, Rangers are back on the training pitch with a new goal in mind. Tomorrow's Scottish Cup final against Hearts is their last shot at silverware this season. Giovanni Van Bronckhorst says his players will be good to go again. We have to uh, said we have another game tomorrow, a very important game because it it, it can it can be mean that we we win silverware this season. That's what we want. That's our, our aim and also our focus now. And I have full confidence that my team will be ready tomorrow when the, when the whistle goes. While Borna Barisic has been ruled out through injury, John McLaughlin will continue as Rangers Cup keeper, meaning a place on the bench for Alan McGregor. He, along with Conor Goldson, are out of contract in the summer.
I've started John um, in in the in the in the cup uh, campaign this this year. Uh, I think he did really well in all the games we played. You know, especially as well the, in the semi final against against Celtic. And uh, so for me, you know, it would be uh, you know change to to change him. Connor, you know, we we've you know the club has been in in in, in talks with him for to extend his contract. Uh, so far, he didn't. Uh, he didn't extend it, uh, but you know the the chance that he will be uh, still a Rangers player uh, tomorrow. Uh, think will be um, uh, will be small, but you know as I said, and also you know I would love to have Connor uh, uh, in, in in the team next year. The last time Rangers won the Scottish Cup in two thousand and nine, they beat Falkirk one nil. Scott Arfield played in that game. For Falkirk, he's determined to be on the winning side this time around. Well, first of all, it's took that long for me to forget it, so thanks very much for remembering me. Uh, it was a long time ago, but um, uh, it was a disappointing day for us. You want to win as many trophies and medals as you possibly can, so it was a uh, it was a sad day. But you know, we're here again. We've managed to get here again. And it would mean a lot because this trophy's um, been away for this football club for a, for a number of years now, so it's. I've got one opportunity tomorrow, however it comes, whether it's 90 minutes, 120 or in penalties, to, to bring that back. After a gruelling 120 minutes in Seville, Rangers hope Saturday will provide their season's silver lining. Ollie Dickinson, STV News. Well, as we said, standing in Rangers' way are hearts. Robbie Nielsen believes his players' experience of playing in big games will be a big plus to his side. Craig Gordon is looking to lift the cup once again in a hearts jersey. There's a lot of them, you know, international players, guys that are playing big games. But yes, over the last, I think, well, over the last, three, the last four years or something, they've been in the, the cup final. So it's uh, that, that definitely bodes well for the group. You know, understanding what the build up's going to be like. You know, it's not a shock when you turn up there and there's, you know, an hour and a half before the game, the streets are lined with tens of thousands of fans. You know, the, the noise and the build up. So, you know, once you've had that experience, it. You know, every time you do it, it becomes a lot more comfortable to be in that environment. For us, we, we know we're playing against a, a really good team who has got a great spirit and has come through some very difficult games and big games. So we know that we have to be at our very best. Uh, and that's all we are preparing for is, is ourselves, to make sure that we arrive at Hamden in the best possible shape. In other football news, Motherwell have confirmed Liam Donnelly, Liam Grimshaw and Mark O'Hara will all leave the club this summer. The trio, who between them have played more than 270 times for the Steelmen, are among nine first team departures from Fir Park. From football to rugby, and Glasgow Warriors take on Edinburgh in the capital tomorrow. The final derby game of the season at Murrayfield will decide the winner of not only the 1872 Cup, but also determine the side's rankings ahead of the playoffs. I think we're just looking forward to the game now. It's um, yeah, obviously it's been a couple of weeks that we've uh, yeah, all eyes have been on this one. So just looking forward to getting out at Murrayfield now and and starting the game. But yeah, got guys are in good spirits and um, we've had a pretty sharp week of training. I think the the one message for for me is to go out and enjoy the game, it, and and to enjoy the game. Uh, we want to put absolutely everything into it. We want to be really sharp with our our detail, our, our game management, our, our physicality. Um, I don't want us to be a, a burden playing because it's um, because there's so much riding on it. I want it to be an experience for us. And finally, tennis shoes. Cameron Norrie is through to the final of the Leon Open after his three sets win in his semi-final match. Get your fill of the action. STV Sports, sponsored by Papa John's Pizza. Philip, how's the weekend weather? And I'm not seeing much sunshine. Hello, good evening. Well, unfortunately, things are staying unsettled as we head towards the weekend. Saturday, we do see high pressures trying to build in from the southwest. So it will give us a bright start to the day, but it's not strong enough to hold off these fronts that are moving in from the west, bringing with it a lot of patchy rain and showers. They're all associated with this low pressure to the north of the country. So as we head into the start of next week, it will be remaining unsettled and changeable. Let's take a closer look at what's in store, though. Here is the forecast. The outlook for the day is calm and settled.
Tui Blue Hotels. Sponsor STV Weather. Well, as we head through the rest of this evening and overnight, this frontal system and band of rain that's been lingering across western parts today does eventually start to push eastwards. And through the early hours of tomorrow morning, it will clear the country. Behind it, though, we are seeing further scattered showers moving in from the west, and some of those could be quite heavy at times. The winds will start to ease down, though. Temperature-wise, in any clear, sheltered spots, we could reach lows of around 7 or 8 degrees Celsius. For most towns and cities, though, getting down to around 10 or 11. Now, looking ahead, to tomorrow we need to make the most of the morning because that will be the driest and brightest part of the day we've got high pressure building in from the south it's not strong enough though to keep away these fronts that are moving in from the west so through the afternoon we'll see a mixture of patchy rain and scattered showers moving in temperature wise reaching highs of around 13 or 14 degrees celsius so down a few degrees from the highs of 19 or 20 that we've seen recently it will be feeling a little bit cooler Looking ahead to Sunday now, we've got this next front making its way across the country. That's pepping up the showers. Those will be quite heavy again and very widespread. We could hear the odd rumble of thunder. Around the coasts, it will be quite windy. We could reach gusts of between 30 to 35 miles per hour. Now, looking ahead to Monday, unfortunately, we keep a hold of the unsettled theme. It'll be a day of a mixture of sunshine and scattered showers, but the winds will be easing as we're under the low pressure. Bye-bye. Tui Blue Hotels. Sponsor STV Weather. And finally this evening, Dunfermline has been awarded city status as part of the Queen's Platinum Jubilee celebrations. The Fife Town is one of eight places in the UK and further afield being granted the honour to mark the monarch's 70 years on the throne. Known as the ancient capital of Scotland, local residents say it gives their home the recognition it deserves. Our reporter Laura Piper has more. Once an ancient seat of royalty, now crowned a city in its own right. The bunting is up and on Fermlin, and the Lord Provost himself has been out telling everyone the good news. Yes, we've just been made a city today, oh. on Fermlin. Everyone I've spoken to on the street has recognised the fact that we've got city status. We're so proud of being the ancient capital of Dunfermline. Before it moved to Edinburgh, we have Dunfermline Abbey, 20 plus noblemen, kings and queens were, are buried in the abbey. So it's such an ancient, historic, and I've got to be Jen, a fantastic place to stay. Judging by these smiles, the locals hey, agree. Jack. <laughs> Thanks. So it was a great thing for Dunfermline, you know, it's a lovely place and it's got huge historical value and culture and things, so it's a really good thing for it to be known as this city. I'm delighted. I just think it's about time, you know, it's, it's been a long time coming. Oh, gosh, it's got so much history. I mean, you, if you go down to the You've got the town clock, you've got the abbey, you've got the glen, you've got the history of Andrew Carnegie. The local barber may even consider a change in name. It's now a city, after all. That's good news. Hi, good. It's nice. Hi, nice to be upgraded. <laughs> there are plans for a new city square and an upgrade to the high street as local sites take on their new status. The city chambers just behind me can now officially live up to its name as Dunfermline becomes the eighth city in Scotland. But a lot of work had to take place to get to this point. I was absolutely determined that in 2022 we would have that bid ready and we would throw the kitchen sink at it. We've had a lot of folk working together and I think that's the makings of a city is that people have to work together and work communally for the benefit of each other and I do think we've had that in Dunfermline. Legal documents from the Queen will now be prepared and presented to the winning cities later in the year. Laura Piper, STV News from the city of Dunfermline. <laughs> Well, that's it from us for tonight. The Late Bulletin is after the news at 10 and bulletins throughout the weekend. From all of us, thanks for watching. Good night. Bye-bye.